opposition to the uh, center march uh, from in March. He's been was appointed research associate. He's working with our colleague um, Sabi Ore, uh, and his seminar today is uh, entitled "From Soft Robotics to Tactile Interfaces." And just uh, a reminder again: these uh, lunchtime seminars are recorded, uh, so. Um, they can be reviewed back uh, on the CFPR website uh, for posterity. So without any more to do, I shall switch off my camera and my audio and hand over to George. Thank you very much. Thanks, Frank. Yeah, so um, I'm going to talk today. This slide is kind of an amalgamation of most of the research I've done up to date. I'm not going to touch on everything, but most of it I'll talk about um, at least a little bit. Um, and in fact, I'm actually going to start a little bit before soft robotics chronologically but hopefully i've uh, tied everything together into a coherent theme that's interesting to um uh, see hold on a second so the um idea of using robotics as an experimental platform rather than as just kind of engineering machines to achieve a purpose is something that i heard kind of first mentioned by alan winfield who's a founder of the brl here uh talk about on the radio and that's kind of largely how I see the academic area of robotics now. Um, and one big area that robotics has experimented in is biology, where there's sort of an idea that we can borrow mechanisms from nature or, or evolution and co-opt them to do other things. So you might be wondering why I've got this picture of a massive transformer on screen. And that's from the, the film Transformers, which I didn't love, but they did have this scene in it where they had a... Uh, this 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 futuristic machine landed from space and they say oh, all of the technology we've ever known is backwards engineered from this example of something um you know incredible and that's kind of not too far not too different from the thinking behind uh bio inspired engineering you know there, it, generally if you want to engineer something there's usually some sort of solution in in nature that's already done it and already found quite an optimal um way to do it um so from my uh physics background, which was my kind of original uh, area of study. I have a real interest in how natural systems have emergent properties. So that's kind of systems that can't be explained by reducing them to constituent parts so that you can't explain, um, let's say conductivity by using a single atom or the resonant frequency of an object by reducing it down to, to single atoms. Um, and so it's only when you consider things with a large number of constituent parts that properties like that become um, feasible. And indeed, it's only when you consider systems that they make it makes sense to talk about those kind of properties. So organic systems do this as well, or um, I guess biological systems do this as well. So, weep, for example, slide. Oh, yeah, so for example, ant colonies optimize the way to find food from their nest. This is by dropping pheromones. Um, slime mold can solve mazes, basically if you put food at one end then it will optimize its path through the maze and um, um, starlings will form murmurations and this is kind of all emergent big swarm behavior and indeed something that I was particularly interested in um, which inspired my research a few years ago was how some swarms, some groups have heterogeneous relationships, so this is the example that I'm showing you here is clownfish so they kind of always have a dominant female within one group and if that female dies or goes missing or something then one of the males has a sex change and takes the position of the dominant female and this is kind of done without any um, voting or any kind of top-down system uh, control it's just an emergent property of how the clownfish interact so i was really interested to know how you could kind of have this role allocation within groups without having to control specifically for it so the um, example that i looked at i worked with a biologist who had worked with um spiders and spiders typically aren't social but they have there's a particular um there are a few species of spiders that they call pseudo-social or proto-social because some of the times they're social but some of the times they kill and eat each other um and they allocate roles within the swarm based on how big the group is so when there's a really big when there's a really big group of them they take more risk and they go out and uh, hunt more in um which they can afford to do because if someone die it doesn't matter so much they've got some spiders um taking care of the, the the young and building the um building the web and so on and the way that they do this is really simple it's just it's essentially how often they bump into another spider if they're bumping into other spiders all the time then they're like okay this is a pretty densely populated area i'll go out and hunt 
Um, and I did find a small. Uh, can I skip this? Uh, uh, this is George Dickinson. Okay, I might. I can't control the time in that, so I'm going to skip that bit. Um, Yeah, so essentially they they just because there's more of them at the center of the nest, if they bump into each other more, then they think, okay, there's a densely populated area, I'll go out and do some hunting. And we showed through a few simulations that you can um this is kind of adaptive. And if you cut the population in half or if you remove all of the spiders that are going out hunting, the population kind of reacts to that. And then proportionally, uh, some of the spiders might um, you know, become more bold and go out hunting, or some of them might stay at home, whichever is more appropriate. So this um, idea of building um, robotic or simulated versions of stuff in order to understand systems, uh, I really like. And this quote, I should probably put up who said it. So it was Richard Feynman who said it, what I cannot build, I do not understand. And this, um, um, this can be applied if we look to kind of more human focused um, than spider focused. So if we think about robotic, sensors and control techniques they show us what what we as people are really good at we tend to be um well one thing that we are very good at is highly dexterous manipulation and integrating sensor information from you know different types of um of sensors and oops sorry i keep scrolling um and uh so when it comes to touch, we don't really have a robot that does that very well. We have nothing like a universal touch sensor in the way that we're kind of, we kind of nailed it with cameras and microphones. They pretty much do what our eyes do and what our ears do. You know, there's, there's space between, you know, telling objects about or telling pitch and things, but pretty much eyes and eyes and ears are mimicked very well by cameras and microphones. Um, part of this is because touch is really really complicated you know you have like heat sensitive stuff you have pressure you have we have specific neural um systems that respond to kind of like emotional touch uh, and pain so part of it is because it's really complicated complex and part of it is because it's kind of necessarily subjective you know in order to interact with something you can't just be a bystander in the way that you can look at something or hear something with sound you kind of have to touch it and morph it and interact with it um so a lot of touch sensors focus on high surface detail. And this is partly one of the reasons I think we see this a lot is because it looks nice. So you can publish a nice video or you can have, have a paper with really cool images in distances from Facebook, from Meta. Um, and a lot of sensors that do this look at surface detail. Um, and this is something that you can, it's kind of what they call like visual tactual affordance. So it's like looking at something you can kind of tell what it's going to feel like. So this is something that people do subconsciously all the time. And you really notice it if, you, if you're if you wrong, right? If you look at something and it's actually plastic, but you think it's metal, then it, it immediately seems strange to you. Um, so the, what this what this particular sensor does from Meta isn't too different from, um, I guess, photogrammetry. They shine light in from a uh, 360 uh, angle and then push an interface. So this... This, each of these centers has a little camera in. They push an elastomeric interface against an object and basically bounce light off it and look at how that happens. So, um, and yeah, so looking at these kind of visual properties is something that we do uh, subconsciously as well. Uh, the tactile property that I was interested in in my research was in exploring stiffness change. So this is like feeling an object within another object, whether it's like embedded in a soft object. So if you think kind of princess and the pea, I'm talking about whether you can feel the P at the bottom of the load of uh, soft mattresses. And this project that I worked on was attached to and funded by Cancer Research UK for the purpose of doing clinical examinations of tissue and finding um, tumors and growth. So when we do this, when people do palpate objects, we stiffen our elbows and our fingers and our wrists and our shoulders so that you can press more um, hard so that you can apply more force. Um, and this is nice. This obviously works pretty well. I was interested in doing something similar, but with a much simpler control. So rather than having however many joints you have towards the end of your fingers, I just want to vary one parameter. So um, I looked at nature for inspiration from this and landed on using spider limbs and mammalian ears. So I'll show you how my, I tell how, yeah, I will tell you how my sensor works first, and then tell you how that is bio inspired. So the general setup is is this. So you have a um, an interface here that I'm just pressing against a glass surface. It's connected via liquid in tubes to um, another location, 
which in this case is filmed by a camera. And then you basically look how the, oop, you can basically watch how the, um, how the liquid moves in the tubes and render that um, to see where the force is being applied and characterize that to see how much force is being applied. So you might be thinking, what's that got to do with spiders in particular and human ears? The spider part is that spider limbs actually move. They don't have muscles in the legs. They're like hydraulically pumped. So they the center of a spider increases its pressure hydraulically and the spider kind of um, flings out its limb in reaction to that. And it's one of the reasons why they move slightly creepily. And the ear, um, so it, in mammals' ears, we have a thing called a eustachian tube, which equalizes pressure over the eardrum. Um, and so this is... The, when that's blocked or something, it feels like your ears are blocked. Uh, yeah, that feels like your ears are, um, you know, in pain or whatever. But it also optimizes the sensitive range of your eardrum to a pressure. So I copied this idea by attaching a just off screen to the left. There's a, a, a syringe pump, so you can pressurize the the air, which in turn pressurizes the sensor and stiffens it. So you can get this. Um, you can apply more force basically by stiffening the sensor by just varying the single parameter of pressure. Uh, and it works quite nicely. The top left are some of the results. You, you can get quite high surface detail. I, put, I printed and palpated a small kind of flower um, type shape uh, for the surface detail. And that's stiffness approximation. You get a kind of characteristic curve if you press on something that's stiff or soft, and then you can say um, how stiff something is. And indeed, we demonstrated using a um, uh, a phantom piece of tissue that you can see in the top left, basically a marble embedded within silicone that you can pass this sensor over the over the surface of it and pressing in and you can locate and kind of characterize the shape and size of a nodule um, quite deeply. So this was like about 30 millimeters deep, which is deeper than elsewhere in the literature. Um, there are a couple of other things that I actually found kind of more exciting that I'll just talk about very briefly. So I said in the last slide that you can watch this uh, liquid move up and down in the tube and I, I used a camera to do that and, and machine vision essentially there are two other ways I looked at of sensing this um, movement of the liquid essentially one of them was to uh, use liquid metal instead of a dye then you can set up a capacitive plate near this so that as the liquid metal moves around the capacitance changes and you get just a nice quite sensitive change in voltage as the liquid metal moves uh, over the over the plate or through the plate in this case and the other um, thing I looked at was doing this acoustically. So in the bottom left, I've got two images. One is obviously just a musical instrument. Uh, and then the second is how I um, turn this into a sensor. So if you imagine kind of like a, I think they're called a slide whistle or like the clangers were, you know, with the, where you change the length of the, of the, of the resonant um, air column in an instrument, essentially you do that. We blow across the top of this capillary as the liquid moves up and down the pitch changes and i was hoping that we'd get some like really nice synesthesia like cool thing to listen to but actually it's just a horrible squeal that slightly changes in pitch um so yeah that that one was i don't know fun but not necessarily that useful um one other nice thing about this is you can change the geometry of it and the morphology of it and you don't need to change the mechanism at all so i i shrunk shrunk the sensor down to be about I said, yeah, I think it's about one centimeter wide. Um, and one of the nice things you can do is start to sense really small uh, tactile stimuli. So I've just had this paper accepted for uh, by a Rob in Germany, um, which is nice. Uh, and I essentially have, oh, okay, I've, well, fine. Um, so essentially, if uh, I've matched up where the sensor is sensitive to the kind of size of Braille text. And just using this, you don't need to use any machine learning or anything, which is sometimes quite nice because it just works off the bat. You can pass the pen over Braille text and you get a signal or something like that on the right. I'll just play that one more time. So as you, it's poorly synchronized, but you can imagine it synchronized in your head. As you pass this sensitive pen over Braille text, you get a signal, um, a time-wise signal that you can convert to space. And... Yeah, and then there's there's your braille text. Thanks. So this is useful because there's there's not really any um, technology that does this in the same way. There are some things you get where you can take like a photo of braille text, for example, and it can convert it and read it to you um, aloud or save it or something. But there's nothing that 
um, does it t um, tactically, I guess is the uh, the uh, adjective. The the benefit of it being that it could help people to learn independently. So Braille is, I don't know if people know, but Braille sort of always said to be a dying um, mode at the moment. Not many people are learning it, despite the fact that loads of people want to learn it. And one of the reasons is it's difficult to find teachers, particularly away from cities. So this is kind of like a piece of independent technology that people could hopefully use to um, well, help them learn how to read Braille. So this got me on to thinking about tactile interfaces, particularly with people with low or no vision, which ties into the project that I've started here a few months ago with Xavier um, CFPR. So the kind of, uh, I guess the concept of what I'm doing is similar to what I was saying um, we as people do when we look at a texture, right? If you, you, you look at a texture in close detail and we can kind of model quite accurately or quite nicely what that is actually gonna um, feel like when we touch it. So I'm trying to train a workflow that can do the same thing. Um, so there are some, and this is particularly for uh, looking at artwork that you typically can't touch because it's valuable or, or fragile and also particularly for visually impaired audiences. There are solutions that exist that I probably should have included examples of and haven't, um, but they, they generally work by segmenting the, the picture or the artwork into different types of texture and then coming up with some sort of code for a texture. So they might say, this is sewn using this stitch, we're going to represent that with small spikes, or this is sewn using another stitch, we're going to have small bumps to represent that. But there's not necessarily like any relation between the 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 how they manifest the texture and what the original texture is. It's just kind of codified as being different things. Um, and something else that's kind of, I guess, a shortcoming of uh, existing methods is that particularly people with very low vision or no vision at all, they find it quite hard to um, piece together obfuscated objects. So in this example, we've got a ladder that's been split into three different areas. Um, and it's pretty easy looking at it to see that it's all one thing, but if you're feeling it, it feels like three separate objects and it's not necessarily easy to tie them together. So I wanted to make something that conserves as much of the original texture as possible, but also pulls apart these objects and completes them so that you can have some sort of description of, a, um, of an artistic piece. And then you can, uh, the person interacting with it, you'd, they'd, they'd, they'd have an interaction with each of the, of the elements of an artistic piece individually, and then next to it, they have the whole complete piece. So it would be easier to comprehend. I'll briefly walk you through the workflow. So trying to kind of make it as simple as possible, you would, the museum or someone would upload a color photo of the um, artistic piece. And in this example, I've chosen the, the ladder and you can, at the top image, I've just clicked basically where the texture is. So that's the texture that comes out. It's a it's a very high definition photo. It kind of has to be at this stage, um, but that's kind of feasible. And then we can use AI algorithms, stable diffusion to generate similar textures. So whilst this isn't identical, and obviously the colors change a little bit, this is four samples of just, I haven't cherry picked these. These are just four that came out when I when I ran it. Um, and we can make depth maps of the depth maps of these so that we get a sort of um well so that we can start to mimic the texture and these are all tileable so you can scale them over a whole object or a whole image i guess if you like and you have a, the same texture over the whole place um and we get yeah so these on the right are uh actual extruded 3d objects visualized in blender the top one is just a depth map drawn from the original image and the vault two are from the AI generated image. So they're not, you know, they're obviously not identical, but they kind of capture a lot of the similarities about the texture. Um, you can see that just from looking at it. And the nice thing about having them tileable and um, segmented in this way is we can then apply the texture visually and physically over the original image so that we get something like a, a completed ladder, which here I've put back over the original image, but you can imagine we could pull it out and explore each of the objects independently. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of it. There's a lot of intricacies around the AI. I think one quite interesting thing, I guess, um, ontologically, is that this isn't these AI models aren't specifically trained to do this. They're just trained to generate images that look nice. But if you like tweak them and join them together in a certain way, then it seems like they kind of understand something about the three D scene. So just from being trained on loads of images, yeah, you can pull out this stuff that 
makes sense and like is valid about kind of the real 3D world that they these models haven't had explicit training of. Um, so yeah, that's about it. I think I'm going to start soon making actually making some objects. So I'm going to be starting to experiment how that we can transfer from a you know 3D um, image file or 3D file into something that's useful and nice to touch. Um, okay, cool. That's me. Any questions? Thanks. Hey, are there any questions from the room? Sonny. Um, you know, with the um, <laughs> um, um, with the AI, um, you said it wasn't trained to do that, but did you then train it to no. um, understand the text? Did you just put the modules together, together in a way yeah. to, for it to understand? Yeah, yeah. So I've just put them together. There's a thing called a lot of the heavy lifting is done with something called like an IP adapter, which basically does like an abstraction of the style and composition of the piece. So basically, once you get the texture, uh, this texture at the top, that's what you can plug in and it will generate stuff that's you can control kind of what you're going for in terms of color or style or um, mm. uh, composition or whatever. And that's doing a lot of heavy lifting, but that's normally for like artistic style. So like an oil painting or whatever, or if you feed it loads of Van Gogh, then it would copy that style. Yeah. But I guess that like... is looking at texture, isn't it? Of the, the, the brush strokes or how it's applied. Yeah. It's looking at like, uh, Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously, it is what you're saying that it kind of is trained on on texture implicitly. Um, you probably could make that argument. But yeah, it, I guess you know, nothing... or it kind of understands by understanding a painting or a style. Yeah, it must be accounting for a bit of that sort of three D relief. Yeah, sure. It, well, it's accounting for how the three D is projected onto two D, right? It doesn't have anything. It is just images. It doesn't have anything, for example, like like photogrammetry or the same image from different angles that kind mm. of are traditionally what you'd need to generate a three D image. So yeah. when when Zavi, for example, does a three D scan of something, you get I don't know how many it's twenty four images from a whole um, from mm. around, and then you do some vector calculus and add it together, so you do actually have a three D object. This mm. is all kind of implicit. They have they have textual properties, yeah, like the the like you say like the brush strokes, or in this case the thread. But there's nothing. The three D information isn't like actually in there. It's all kind of implied. Yeah. So this is kind of what I meant by it. it's what we do when we look at something and we kind of infer what the text is like. So it's something that we people are usually quite good at. Um, and, and with the height maps, um, yeah. did you get it to generate? Uh, like, how did you generate those? Is that part of the workflow yes. that you had to sort of muck around with? That's. That's so that's a uh, another AI thing called Midas, but they have the problem. The difficulty with depth thing is that they usually, um, then they are really not made for textures. They're usually made for like rooms and stuff, so you can tell who's behind who and how far away things are. So it's often using driverless cars and things, so you can know the person behind a lamppost or something rather than the other way around. And so they have a really big bias for saying whatever's at the bottom of the image is close and whatever's at the back of the image is far away. Mm. So it was quite a struggle to get it to tile properly and to recognize that there's actually something flat. And you also get in like, I mean, the fact that I'm showing you this on the screen is a good example, right? None of this actually has any depth in the stuff mm. that you actually give to the, it, it, it's all, it's all um, if within a painting that has texture, the artist has painted in some depth, it's quite mm. hard to get the AI not to say, you know, that's just a photo, so it's flat. It'll actually try and add some depth into to a representation of something. Yeah, so, it's know, kind it of really sense. backwards, yeah, because the artist has interpreted depth into 2D. Yeah. And then you're trying to interpret the 2D into its relief, but not but accounting not for the visual perception of depth. Yeah, so there's kind of two... Yeah, so I mean, this, for example, with the ladder, when if I feed it that whole image, then it says that the ladder's going away, but there are people standing on it, and there's, you know, it kind of work out who's in front of who. So within the composition of the picture, the ladder is leaning away, but that's not true. If you know what I mean, in the actual real world, that's a whole flat thing. Mm. But I think something that might come out of this that 
I mean, I'm sure it's probably already been talked about quite a lot, but is the separating of the the fabric on which the eye is done and then the composition. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's really cool. That's fine. Yeah, Karina. In terms of um, in terms of training and pattern recognition, have you got have you has you got the AI in training or a, a a range of different related textures from which it can then draw from? So this is a general purpose. So these are just huge. They're trained on they're trained on just massive image databases. So one thing that I also want to do. One thing that you can do with these is training them on specific textures and specific pictures. So if I, because this, each of these images, we've got um, the real artifacts, sorry, are photographed in, I don't know how many they have, probably on average, we've got 50 photos of each that are little cells. So if I, if I want to, I can segment all of them into tiny little squares, retrain the AI based on that, and we'll probably get something much more accurate and true to the particular picture that we're looking at. So it'll be, it'll be one thing I want to do is see how long that takes, because if you're just, if you're doing that for every single picture you're looking at, that's quite a high demand, but if it only takes five minutes and you upload a few photos and it improves the quality, then that would be worth doing. But at the moment, this is just general. Mm -hmm. It's just a huge database where you hope something in there is a bit similar. Yeah. So it's the database, database basically the internet. So you're kind of... It's something like, yeah. I mean, they're like... They're, using it's curated metadata to... Sorry. So you're basically using working from the kind of the metadata which is in the in the containers for all the of the images, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they, I don't know exactly what the training process is, but it's like it's a stable, stable, stability. I think the organisation are called. They'll have people who are going through and hand labelling everything and mm. grading everything out of ten for how good an image it is of a pair of glasses or something. Um, so it's all like yeah, I think a lot of. Elbow grease. <laughs> What's the name of the company? Stability AI. Stability. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the, yeah, I guess with everything in AI, everything moves so quickly. They're releasing a new model today, so it might be that this uh, that this vastly improves by tomorrow. Um, so yeah, we'll it's, I mean it's quite extraordinary considering, to say that the 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 level of the materials appearance and then the pattern recognition for yeah call up difference in denim for example yeah yeah great thank you any other questions is anyone online got any questions uh <laughs> Oh, I think that's it. If anyone has any fun ideas about how to produce and manufacture some textures, then that's where I'm at now. So I'll be open to, I don't know, either traditional or experimental methods to get texture. So you can do it from the 3D files that you've made, yeah. 3D on the blender, and you want to do them at the scale of the original? Yeah, well, that's a good question. So these are, these are, like a, oops, like a few millimeters across. So yeah, there's a lot of methods where you wouldn't be able to reproduce that. Um, but I, ideally, yeah, I think so. It'd be nice to get, not necessary, but it'd be nice if the like abstraction was quite true to the original rather than having something that was vastly different. Yeah, so it's like, like say with that, with the textiles texture, can you be looking at the the way the thread is and then you'd want to mimic that through a similar process of with thread yeah so that the difficulty there is the dexterity of any I mean, like you could do it by hand i'm sure I mean, that's that is what people do but it's obviously very expensive and not automated but the so if you look at this like doing oh i have my, my pen isn't there mm -hmm. Oh, that's so like what what more like the thing of if you understand the like underlying structure underneath the thread, yeah, to then be able to I, I don't know much about textiles, but just like the idea of like you can then 
like with digital embroidery using a similar thread reproduce yeah so this is something i just messaged sandra who's in the <laughs> she's in the chat yesterday because i was looking at i was wondering whether you could do that essentially my understanding is that like cnc digital embroidery is pretty much just for drawing patterns but i think you could it seems to me like there should be a way that you could at least layer it up so that you're essentially doing something similar to you know, you know traditional 3d printing with thread you, know, you print i could i could segment these images with some kind of height so they have whatever 20 layers do bottom layer stick paper in if it's necessary or something then thread the next layer and just keep going like that so you kind of get yeah so you kind of get like a, it wouldn't be the height that's in this example it obviously comes from it being looped and like sewn from uh, from embroidered from like another direction that's that would be a really difficult thing to do with a machine just because of how dexter sewing is but getting something that kind of mimics it it, it might be rubbish but if you get something that just kind of layers up lines of embroidery yeah. then you get something that might be a bit close. 